Hello everyone. Today I'm going to share a project Task Weaver, and especially I'm going to share a perspective from the AI Ops research. And this is Li Chengli. I'm on behalf of the DKI AI Ops team. Instead of directly diving into the technical details, I will start from a bit of the project history. Since started from the breakthroughs of large language models in reasoning and content generation led by OpenAI in late 2022. Since then, we started exploring various opportunities. Our team has been focused on AIOps research for many years. And in one sentence, AIOps is the application of machine learning and data science to enhance the efficiency and reliability for service operations, customer support, and DevOps. And in this area, we see many common requirements arise from different teams after the breakthrough of LLM. A lot of teams were trying to build a question answering system based on their own domain knowledge, such as troubleshooting guides or engineering docs. And another common requirement is to have the model to tag or categorize verbatims, for example, the user feedbacks. Although existing libraries like Lanchan had provided solutions, we still see many challenges, especially for people who are not familiar with LLM development and prompt engineering. This motivated us to build a common platform to support those requirements. We call it Cloud Copilot. In the early days, we also call it Cloud GPT. So some of you may have heard of this name. Cloud Copilot is a retrieval augmentative generation system, a rack system that can answer questions based on user provided documents. We support a one-stop experience where the user can upload their docs at our website. In the background, we do trunking and indexing. The user can then ask questions from the UX or call the API from their programs. We also support access control for scenario management. To support a higher security requirement, we provide a self-host solution so the user can deploy their own service instance with Azure resources. To solve some of the aforementioned challenges, we also have auto prompt recommendation to help the user to customize their own prompt for their scenarios. We optimized the trunk size to improve the retrieval accuracy. We also have con content attribution that can map the answer to the support documents. This is very useful to eliminate the hallucination problem, which, which is the main challenge for content generation. And today, there are over 500 active scenarios from various teams on Crowd Group Pilot. Later, we realized that the RAC system is not enough for many of our collaborators' scenarios. In AIOps, we usually need to interact with various data sources, such as Custo, SQL, Geneva, or Blob Storage. Once we have the data, we also need to keep it in the memory and uh, keep editing it to answer users' arbitrary questions. And we sometimes need to call the tools or APIs, and especially different teams usually have their own troubleshooting knowledge, so we need to incorporate their knowledge into the system. In June last year, we released a library called Cloud Copilot Pro. The internal code name is Octopus. It's a library that can help the user to build a conversational AI system to interact with various data sources and tools. We call those tools plugins. We allow the user to add examples to input their domain knowledge to guide the model. Thanks to Octopus, users can much easily develop their own copilots and interact in a natural language way for data analysis and troubleshooting. Octopus can be viewed as a code interpreter. It turns the natural language queries into Python code and executes it. We use the chain of thought to generate the code. Chain of thought is a technical to have the model output some source before the code, which is very useful for understanding and reliable code generation. We allow developers to add their plugins and functions that can be called from the code, so they can call their existing tools or, or APIs. We also provided several built-in plugins for common data sources and diagnostic tools. Because data is processed in Python code, we can now represent it using native data structures such as the Pandas data frame for data analysis. The generated code is run in an individual process to keep isolation and security. In one session, the user can interact with the agent many times, and the code blocks across different chat runs 
are executed in the same process. So the execution is stateful. This is different from many existing frameworks, which cannot remember the previous generated code. Finally, the code can sometimes be wrong and we let the model to auto-revise the code based on the execution results, such as the exceptions or the log messages. Here, we recorded a demo and feel free to check it out. Later, we however encountered some challenges when we are applying Octopus to some of our collaborator's scenarios. First, if the task is too complex, the model may fail to generate the correct code. And when the task is very complicated, the generated code can be very wrong and the generation is error prone. Although we have the auto revision, it may not be able to fix the code. And a better solution is actually to decompose the, past, the task into smaller subtasks to solve them one by one. And the second challenge is that Octopus does not support observing the intermediate uh, execution result and reflecting on them and then refine the plan. So the two challenges motivated us to upgrade Octopus to a new framework called TaskViewer. Uh, we inherited uh, the, most of the good parts uh, of Octopus and added new features to address the challenges. In, in this diagram here, we show the architecture of Task Weaver, and the most significant change is that we added a task planner. The planner decomposes the plan into subtasks and then passes them to the code interpreter. The code interpreter generated, uh, generates code for each subtask and executes it. The execution result is then passed back uh, to the planner. The planner can then decide, decide the next step uh, based on the result. We have released the task viewer as an open source project in GitHub in November last year. Besides the task planner, we also added many other features to overcome the challenges, improve the performance and efficiency. We summarized them into a technical report uh, and feel free to check it out from archive. Because the report was submitted to uh, um, almost two months ago, it may not uh, include some of the most recent updates. So in the following, I will deep dive into some of the techniques we used in Task Weaver. This is the agenda. And firstly, I will explain the workflow and the concepts in our system. Now, let's start from a simple demo. And the user query in this demo is to pull data from the database and then apply anomaly detection algorithm on the data. After receiving this request, the planner started to make some plans. And the first step is to pull data from the DB. And now you can see the code has been generated. And now the code executor started to run the code. Okay, the data has been put into a data frame and description of the schema is provided to the planner. The planner sees the data and started to ask, started to ask the code interpreter to apply the anomaly detection. And some arguments are provided And finally, we can see the 11 anomalies uh, are detected and uh, they are stored in a data frame and also a description about uh, how many anomalies are detected are provided to the planner. Finally, the planner composed a response to the user. Let's examine the process of this demo because now we have two roles, the planner and code interpreter we can enable the React feature based on the communications between them, which means the agent can now observe the intermediate results and then revise or refine the previous plan. In the previous demo, the user wants to pull data from the, from the table in the database. The planner splits the task into two steps. The first step is to pull data from the database, and the second step is applying the anomaly detection algorithm. When the first step is done, 
the intermediate results uh, of data frame and the description of the schema, which has two columns, the timestamp and value. Then the second step is applying the anomaly detection algorithm, which takes the two column names as arguments. The final results are a data frame containing the detected anomalies and the description of how many anomalies are detected. This is sent back to the user as the response. In this process, the interesting part is that the planner needs to observe the data schema before applying the anomaly detection algorithm because the two column names are necessary arguments. Without the help of the communications between the two rows, we cannot achieve this. Uh, this diagram here shows the internal workflow happens inside TaskWeaver for the first step about pulling data from the database. Uh, the planner composes its prompt uh, with descriptions about the code interpreter's capabilities, uh, including uh, uh, descriptions of the plugins and the user query here. The output is a list of uh, subtasks that is passed to the code interpreter. Inside the code interpreter, we have two uh, modules, uh, the code generator and the uh, code executor. The code generator generates the code calling the circle uh, plugin to pull data from the database and describe the data schema. And the code executor uh, runs the code and returns returns the re uh, result to the planner. And the planner then decides the next subtask based on the result. We manage the interactions between the user and agent in a session. The messages passed between the user, planner, and the code interpreter are called posts. Each post has a from, to, and a text message. And in addition, a post can have a list of attachments, such as the code, the execution result, or the generated artifacts. This makes it flexible to support different scenarios. A round is basically a collection of posts that starts from the user query and ends with the response to the user. The response here doesn't mean the final answer. Sometimes the agent can ask questions to the user for more information. We maintain uh, separate sessions for different users in the memory, so the service can serve multiple users at the same time. Secondly, let's talk about uh, task planning. In general, the user's request is turned into a set of subtasks that are simpler to solve. When the planner uh, composes the prompt, we allow adding manually crafted uh, examples to help the model to plan better, especially for the complex tasks. And each example includes the user query and the desired planning result. However, we sometimes see the planner generates a plan that is too fine-grained. Here is an example. Uh, in this example, the user request is to load the data from a CSV file show the column names and count the number of rows. We can actually see that the whole request can be done in a single code block. But if we look at the plan from the planner uh, here, you can see that it splits uh, the task into several steps. The step one to load the file, second step is to extract the column names, and the, second, uh, the third, third one is to count the number of rows, and finally it will report the information to the user. And if we follow this plan, Although it's correct, uh, it needs to call the model many times, leading to uh, a waste of tokens and low latency. To solve this problem, we proposed a new technique called two-phase planning. The planner first generates a, an initial plan and then refines it to the final plan. In the initial plan, we ask the planner to identify the dependencies between the subtasks. There are two types of dependencies the sequential dependency and the interactive dependency. If two tasks are sequentially dependent, it means one subtask must be executed run, uh, before the other, but it does need to involve the user or the large language model to make decisions in between. And in contrast, if two subtasks are interactively dependent after executing the first subtask, the user or the large language model needs to interact with the system before running the second subtask. Let's go back to this uh, example here. It has four uh, subtasks. The first step is to load in a file. 
and we know that the data should be loaded before displaying the column names or counting the number of rows. That's why uh, you can see here the subtask 2 and 3, uh, both of them sequentially depends on the first uh, subtask. So we can mark them as a sequential dependency. However, consider the final uh, subtask, which is subtask 4. We need to call the LLM to compose the response to the user after obtaining the column names and the row count. So we mark it as interactive dependency. In the second phase, we refine the initial plan by merging the consecutive uh, subtasks that are sequentially dependent. And this is another example. Uh, the user request is a read file uh, called manual.txt and follow the instructions in it. And uh, in this example, because the model uh, does not know the instructions before reading this file, so all the dependencies are interactive. So uh, finally, the final plan is identical to the uh, initial plan. And with this technique, we can actually save uh, the tokens and reduce the latency, end-to-end -end latency. So for code generation, I'm going to focus on the uh, verification part. Uh, a challenge of code generation is that the codes may not be secure, especially uh, in our system, we, only, uh, we generate the general purpose programming language. Uh, although we can add instructions in the prompt uh, to prevent it, it is still not a reliable solution. And that's why we propose that code verification process. And with, once the code is generated, we use the uh, code verifier uh, to check if the code is secure. The code is first passed into a abstract syntax tree or AST. We then apply rules to check if the code violates any security rules. The rules can be about uh, importing uh, modules and calling functions or using variables. Uh, in this specific example here, we may uh, restrict the code from calling the execute function here, which is uh, because it's very powerful. Uh, the code verification errors are sent to the code generator to retry generating the code again. Yeah. Uh, in addition, uh, we also support uh, uh, plugin only mode, mode uh, based on the uh, LRM function calling. In this mode, we only allow to call the plugin functions, but not generating any arbitrary code. This is uh, very useful for scenarios that require high security, and there is uh, no need to generate uh, code. Finally, I will share how we incorporate terminology by saving uh, the user experiences. The agent developers can add example to guide the planning and code generation. And alternatively, we also provide another way of saving user experiences to the long-term long memory. In practice, if the user asks TaskViewer to solve a very hard problem, TaskViewer can first go wrong. But after several attempts, or the user gives more instructions, the agent can finally solve the problem. However, next time, if the user asks a similar problem, or even exactly the same problem, the agent is still hard to come up with the right solution at the first time because it does not memorize the past experiences. And therefore, we proposed a mechanism called experience memory. Here is the basic idea. The user can issue a command to TaskViewer to save chat history and then extract the experience tips from it and save them into the experience pool. Later, when the agent sees a similar request, it will retrieve the experience from the memory to get its planning and code generation. And an experience tip is about what to do or what not to do when seeing a request like this. We will add uh, the retrieved, retrieved experiences to the prompt when received a similar request afterwards. We also plan to support retrieving from a knowledge base and currently, this feature uh, is still an active development and not available yet in the code base. Here is a summary. TaskViewer is a code-first agent framework for seamlessly planning 
and executing data analytics tasks. It has many features such as rich data structure, incorporating domain knowledge, customized algorithms, code verification, stateful execution, security consideration, and easy to use and debug. Some of our future work includes more secure and uh, isolated code execution, for example, inside the dark containers, and better web UX and streaming support, and more AI apps, scenario integrations, and more plugins. Okay, thank you. All right, hello everybody. Uh, I'm hello. Alex. Uh, I'm here joined with Li Chun and Siling. They're both the main authors of Taskweaver, one of the agent frameworks that we've been building at Microsoft. And uh, as you may have seen from the, the talk just now, uh, it's a very interesting, very compelling framework that they've been building for a lot of the use cases that they're trying to solve for their customers. So I think that's it's very customer centric in what they've been doing. So it's great to, to have them here. We can have some pseudo live Q&A, uh, but maybe uh, Shi Ling and, and Li Chun, do you want to introduce yourselves just very quickly? Yeah, th this is Li Chun. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, I have introduced myself in the in the in the presentation. So I'm from the uh, DKI team. Uh, I'm I'm based from from Beijing. Uh, and our team has been focused on the ops research for many years. And myself, uh, I also uh, did a lot of work for instant management. Yeah, and great uh, to 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 be here. Very good. She did. Okay. Yeah, hi, I'm Shiling. I'm also from the uh, DKI ops team. So uh, we have been working on this uh, um, related uh, works in the past year. And uh, it's a good honor to you know, you know have the opportunity to discuss with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Great. So I guess first off is uh, considering uh, this framework, um, how do you ensure the quality and reliability, reliability of the code that's being generated by the large language models, right? Especially when you deal with uh, complex data structures and algorithms. I think for for code generation, yeah, it's, uh, it's super important for our framework because it's uh, yeah, it's code first, right? And uh, and but to be honest, uh, we will have to admit that the the quality of the generated code uh, highly depends on the capability of the model today, and. Uh, we we can only yeah think of uh, other ways to to optimize it, but uh, it's really hard really to guarantee the, the quality of the code. So we have several uh, I will, I will, I will share from three perspectives. And the first one is that um, I think the motivation of uh, of Task Weaver is that we want to have a planner to decom de decompose uh, complex tasks into smaller uh, steps. So for each smaller step, then it's actually easier to implement the code in, right? you know, more reliable and uh, yeah, in a better way, basically. And uh, the second uh, part is that we have, uh, as we introduced in the in the talk, we have the code verification process, where we actually uh, have a static uh, code analysis to parse the code into the syntax tree, and then we. Um, we, we use some predefined rules to to check if the code violates some of the those rules. Yeah, this is a, actually the second part. And uh, the final one is that after running the code, if we we, we observe the some exceptions or, or error messages, we will ask uh, the, the model to regenerate the code and provide those informations. So, yeah, from the three perspectives, we we're trying to make the code generation better. Yeah. Shilin, do you have anything to, do you want to add to that? <laughs> okay, very good. Well, thank you. Um, how about we dive deeper then on this type of like plugin uh, kind of architecture or just like how do you think about extensibility uh, inside Taskweaver, right? So yeah. part of part of it is like how do you approach the design of, you know, long term, right? Mm -hmm. That allows users to define and invoke uh -huh. custom plugins different for different tasks and domains. Okay, uh, I think for for the plugins, uh, the most uh, uh, important challenge in our mind is the scalability. And 
if we only have like uh, several plugins, it, it's not going to be a problem. But if I have uh, like tens or even more plugins, then the scalability issue will become quite significant because it's uh, it's just uh, impossible really to put all the the descriptions into your prompt. Yeah, that will yeah uh, consume a lot of tokens basically. So uh, in our current design, we have uh, something we call dynamic uh, plugin selection. And uh, for each user request, we will retrieve uh, some plugins based on their descriptions, uh, based on the similarity right, uh, between the user's request and the descriptions of the, the plugins. So based on this, we only you know, uh, put uh, a small uh, fraction of relative plugins into the prompt that helps to save the, the tokens here. And uh, this is a current current uh, situation. And in the in the long run, we actually consider consider it from two uh, points. The first one is uh, uh, because you know uh, there are already a lot of uh, existing plugins out there, but for different frameworks like uh, like ChatGPT plugins, and definitely we we need to consider the com compatibility problem, right? And we, uh, we are, uh, yeah, we are going to uh, work on the compatibility so that uh, we can uh, make it easy for the user to add their existing uh, plugins for other frameworks to Task Fever. Yeah, that that's one thing. And uh, actually, another uh, interesting idea is is uh, uh, I, I like to call it agent side plugins. Uh, 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 an agent actually is is typically more powerful than a single plugin, and we can have uh, uh, each uh, agent to solve problems for for a certain area, and then we can actually call this agent uh, as a plugin in Task Weaver. And I think this uh, is actually a, a very nice way or a potential way to actually modulate modulize a complex uh, our system. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, this probably uh, are considerations now. Yeah, so speaking about modularity and the inherent, let's say, like scalability of, of Task Weaver, right? I guess, how do you assess, um, yeah, just like the, the quality performance of, of the framework itself? Okay. And have you, have you kind of encountered situations where you need to, um, where, where you you've had to like actually uh -huh. scale out a very big yeah, application, yeah. and can you share some of the insights for, and challenges that you experienced to do so? Yeah, and uh, actually, to be honest, uh, our uh, current application scale is not really that large, right? So, so, but uh, we, we indeed uh, observe that uh, uh, some performance or scalability issue here. But but uh, uh, we can see that. Some, uh, the bottleneck is prob prob probably not at the framework. It's uh, it's actually more at the LLM inferencing. Right? You need to wait uh, like tens of minutes uh, to to get a response from the from the model. Yeah. That's uh, uh, yeah. So it's more uh, restricted by the the model itself. And uh, yeah. And in terms of for the, the the performance, so indeed. Uh, have some test cases to to test its capabilities, and if you look at the uh, open source repo, we have uh, uh, I think uh, about twelve test cases, and uh, one one each of those test cases is is a workflow. We have the input and the desired output, and we also measure the uh, some of those uh, intermediate milestones, and finally we we can calculate a score for each uh, test case. And we currently use this uh, to test uh, its uh, its uh, yeah its correctness or something like that. And but in the in the future we we also plan to test uh, the performance uh, with some benchmarks. But uh, we actually investigated investigated some of those benchmarks. Uh, it's actually a bit uh, a, a bit tricky here because it's uh, it's actually hard to thoroughly test uh, the framework, but put the capability of the model aside. So we, we really need to very carefully to select the test cases and the benchmarks. Yeah, yeah, that's for the performance and scalability. Yeah. Have you noticed any, let's say, inherent limitations in the framework right now? Yeah. Not, not, not the model, but yeah. just even uh, the framework. I mean, 
OK, yeah, that's actually a very good question. I think uh, uh, instead of uh, directly answer this question, uh, I, I think we need to first consider the, the scenario. Um, I think uh, if you consider those uh, static tasks, right, maybe a flow is it's much better than uh, agent because it's, uh, it's more controllable and uh, it's easier to optimize the, the flow to, to get better performance. Right? And so for those autonomous agents, I think uh, maybe the, the, the scenario is more likely uh, to be fragile or, or fragmented. So it's, it becomes hard to really to optimize its performance towards those fragmented requests, actually. So in, the, in, this, uh, suggest, uh, in this situation, and we, we can see a significant uh, uh, challenge here is that uh, the performance of the large language model actually can, can, can vary from time to time. Uh, even you, yeah, because the model is actually changing, right? And even it's not changed, uh, you can still see the performance variations. So, so it's very hard to, to always guarantee a good performance under under this condition. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So one of the emerging ideas popularized by uh, Autogen, right, uh, is mm -hmm. this concept of of multi agent, right, as opposed yeah. to single agent. Um, yeah. So I guess question to you is will Taskweaver incorporate these multi-agent ideas or do you guys plan to just continue to have it just be single agent? Yeah, what are your thoughts there? Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's another very good question, actually. I think, uh, first of all, multi-agent is a very uh, flexible architectural design. So we actually don't want to uh, really restrict uh, ourselves uh, by insisting on either a single agent of, uh, architecture or a multi-agent architecture. Uh, it all depends on the scenario or the problem we want to solve. Um, we actually have uh, discussed this, uh, this question in our technical report and provided two uh, ways to, to consider a task river uh, in a multi-agent environment. And uh, the, the, actually the first, uh, the first one is like, uh, like I mentioned uh, about the agents as plugins, and other agents can actually be called from Task Weaver as as plugins. So uh, think about uh, if we we have a, a rag agent, and we can call it from Task Weaver to retrieve some uh, like troubleshooting guides or to just use it uh, uh, to answer the user's questions. Yeah, that's that's both okay. And the second. Uh, uh, Point is that if the, there is existing uh, infrastructure uh, uh, of uh, multi-agent, uh, I mean multi-agent infra um, infrastructure where different agents can talk to each other uh, through the net network, if that is the case, I think Task Weaver could be very easily to join the conversation with uh, other agents. Yeah, so it all depends on the, the scenario, I think. And do you feel like there is a kind of clear scenario where multi-agent is actually a good candidate or or more appropriate to to use to to solve that problem? Oh, yeah. Actually, we uh, because uh, we we actually work with different uh, collaborators for different uh, ops scenarios. We indeed see sometimes uh, multi-agent can be a, a better choice. Uh, one of those scenarios would be uh, we have uh, different agents and uh, each of them can talk to, to the users, right? And that and uh, that will be very, uh, I mean, very uh, fl flexible because uh, uh, in, in the current, uh, in, cur uh, in the task viewer, I mean, if, uh, let's say, right, if you, if you, if you have task and uh, we need to call the plugin, and, but inside the plugin we need to Get some information from the user, right? Then we need really to pass the, uh, you know, the the, the ask from uh, the code interpreter and then to the planner and finally to the user, right? And I think in this uh, situation, if the the plugin itself can directly talk with the user, that will be a better uh, way, right? Yeah, I think in this case, uh, a multi-agent framework would be more direct or more suitable for this. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. And I think we will continue to learn about what are these type of use cases 
uh, yeah. over time, certainly in the new year. And <laughs> yeah, it's it's very exciting to, to see. Uh, so I guess maybe to close us off, like, can you share any like last minute tips, any sort of like best practices, guidelines for uh, how you see users uh, being successful with Taskweaver, uh, building agents, building um, you know, mm -hmm. AI applications? Yeah, I think today, although there are uh, actually quite a lot of uh, different frameworks out there, but it, it is still non-trivial to, to really build a solid uh, copilot experience. And uh, for some of those uh, practices or, or guidelines, uh, maybe uh, if, 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 if the user wants to build something with TaskWeaver, I would suggest that uh, although uh, TaskWeaver could be built as a generic framework, it's uh, firstly it's designed for uh, more for those uh, task uh, data analytics tasks. So, yeah, if you have some data set and you want to ask uh, uh, different questions to draw insights from the data set, yeah, that's uh, the, the most uh, uh, suitable or target scenario, actually, the first one. And uh, secondly, I think uh, uh, it's better to actually start from some simple uh, plugins and only focus on the most uh, uh, typical uh, situation and uh, ignore those corner cases to, put, to, to build your proof of concept system and then incrementally add more and more functions and logic into the system to make it more robust against the uh, practical situations. That's probably a better um, practice. And finally, um, uh, especially for those uh, applications, if uh, that's not so typical and uh, if the model uh, have not seen since similar uh, uh, tasks like this before, it's better to add some examples or some experience into the system to get the model for uh, task planning and uh, uh, code generation. That's uh, make it work, work more smooth. Yeah, that's uh, basically some uh, practices. And also, uh, since we have open sourced uh, uh, this project for two months, and we indeed see some uh, frequent uh, uh, questions or issues, raised uh, uh, from GitHub. And one of the most uh, uh, frequent uh, uh, issues is that the users usually want to run the framework using some uh, small, uh, relatively small models, like those 7B ones. But uh, usually uh, they fail to, to see the desired output. And uh, because, yeah, I, th I think uh, uh, reasoning and uh, code generation is still the hard part for um, a language model. So a small model may, may be very uh, hard to really achieve good performance in in, in these two problems. So um, yeah, they can e easily lead to various uh, failures like uh, the output cannot follow the instructions, so we cannot pass it, or the generated code can can be uh, yeah quite wrong. So yeah, so. Yeah, if 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 the user really want to, to have um, uh, the copilot running successfully, I, I mean today maybe we still need a relatively large model. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, these are very good insights and very good good tips that are not just applicable for Taskweaver, but I'm sure anyone yeah. building any of these type of AI applications can 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 learn from. So. Well, thank you for this time, uh, uh, Li Chin and, and Xiling. I really uh, appreciate it. And I'm sure everyone uh, listening uh, uh, appreciate it as well. So, uh, thank you, and have a good have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.